Hello, I'm Judy Hartman, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Winter is no reason not to go salmon fishing in Washington. Right now, the bite is on for Puget Sound blackmouth. So break out the fishing equipment, dress warmly, and listen to some ideas on how to bring home a fish dinner. We're out here on a beautiful mid-December day fishing for uh, juvenile Chinook salmon, commonly referred to as blackmouth. Um, we're here at Point Defiance fishing an outgoing tide. It's historically produced quite a few blackmouth in uh, the month of December and January. So we're out here drift mooching, which is a term for drift fishing, and hopefully we'll get into a few blackmouth today. The average blackmouth you expect to catch out here in the winter is between 5 and 15 pounds. They're pretty abundant, and if you can get into a good bite, you should have some pretty good action, and you can expect to catch quite a few fish during the day. Uh, a lot of the fish you will catch in the winter time is uh, small, under 22 inches, which is the legal size for Chinook, and uh, those fish have to be released. We're fishing with a, a single hook today on about a 5 to 10 foot leader, and uh, you must debarb the hook because of uh, the incidence of catching sublegal fish. So pinching the barb allows for easy release of the fish uh, after you get them to the boat. We typically use five to ten foot of leader. These fish aren't very large and we're going to be fishing extremely deep today so we like to keep the line as light as possible so we don't uh, have to fight a lot of uh, line drag in the water. Dogfish can be a problem out here and if they do get thick and they are a problem you end up going through quite a few leaders during a day's fish so sometimes it helps to um, tie up a bunch of leaders the night before. Today we're uh, drift mooching with uh, herring and personally I like to use cut plug herring uh, because of the way they look in the water. Cut the head off on a uh, slight bevel with the dorsal surface being slightly longer than the ventral surface and one side being longer than the other. It's important to take the guts out of the cut plug because it will uh, interfere with the spinning of the bait. Once you've cut your bait, my favorite rig is to insert the point of the hook into the face of the cut plug right next to the backbone. Push it through and pull it out the far side of the bait right along the color line. Pull the hook through and place it into the side of the fish directly below where the line comes out. I'm using a single hook today because of uh, the likelihood of catching a lot of sublegal sized fish and using a single hook allows me to release the fish without removing it from the water much more easily than with two hooks. Well, I prefer to fish as close to the bottom as possible, but at times the uh, flat fish and bullheads get too thick, so if they are thick, you want to touch bottom and reel back off the bottom as fast as you can and get up to about 30 feet off the bottom. Once you get down, you want to work your bait up and down probably the bottom 60 foot of water you reel up four or five feet and stop, reel up another five or six feet, wait 30 seconds, do it again, wait another 30 seconds, drop it back down to the bottom and just kind of work the bottom 60 feet of water. Oh yeah, there he is. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> Here are some other fishing opportunities across Washington during the coming weeks.
The agency has just debuted Samscape, a new interactive computer mapping system to deliver scientific information to those involved in salmon recovery. If you are interested in the state's fish resources, this may be of some use to you as well. Well, the application Salmonscape is geared towards the natural resource manager and land use planners. And it's our intention to get our salmon and steelhead data out available to those folks that are engaged in salmon recovery planning, subbasin planning, and land use planning. So we're hoping it will be used by groups and individuals active in those, in those arenas. And we think um, that folks will be able to access our fish distribution data, our habitat data, as well as federal and, and state salmonid stock listing information. And so it provides the tools that they need for the decision-making processes that they're engaged in. So in addition to being used by natural resource planners and land use planners, the application is also being used right now by high school students engaged in class projects. So students might be looking at uh, summarizing the extent of distribution of Chinook salmon. They might calculate the number of miles of habitat that could be opened up by removing a particular barrier. So they could use that information to target a restoration project that they might be engaged in or to summarize the impacts of a specific activity on an indiv individual population of salmon. We also expect that the general public may have an interest in the application. It provides information about uh, the salmon recovery process, so folks might be able to just to track the process that um, re natural resource regulators are involved in, planning salmon recovery and making land use decisions at the local level. So, for example, a, um, a private landowner may want to see what fish species are present on their property. Perhaps they're uh, considering purchasing a piece of property. They may want to know what species are present, what sort of federal status those species hold. So those are some uses. Um, the general public may also be interested in just identifying a good fishing hole. And so they can get on the application, um, use aerial photographs to see what the general landscape is around an area that they're considering. They may want to uh, look at the, the gradient layer. They can see how steep the terrain is, either by pulling up the stream segments, stream characteristics layer, or by looking at uh, uh, topographic relief models. So there are a number of things of general interest, as well as the natural resource management and scientific applications. Swan populations passing through Washington have been dying. It was discovered that the cause of death has been lead poisoning. Now our science teams are attempting to find out where the swans are getting the lead. We've had over the last four years, we've had at least 860 swans succumb to lead poisoning. Um, we also had a die off of 100 plus in 1992 with a large gap in between. Um, we're trying to mark up to 200 trumpeter swans to follow them for the winter and hope that they lead us to the source of the, the lead pellets. We capture swans by uh, locating fields. Uh, generally, it's, it's corn fields that they're uh, foraging in. Um, we'll lay out a, a bait pile of, of cob corn. Um, adjacent to that bait pile, we'll set a, either a single net or a series of nets that we'll, we'll fire uh, simultaneously. Um, when, the, when everything is right, we'll uh, detonate the net, which will shoot up over the bait pile and hopefully capture what birds are, are on the pile. These birds are much quicker at getting out of the way than, than you would think. Um, the net uh, from fire to on the ground is just about two seconds and usually more than half of the birds on the bait pile will get out of the way and not get caught. We'll take a blood sample from this bird. Um, We'll put a little in a vial for DNA analysis. Um, we'll put a mill in, uh, in a vial for um, lead uh, testing to determine the, how much lead's in the blood on this bird. Um, that'll en enable us to be sure that this is a uncontaminated bird that uh, once we get him radio collared and released, then we'll follow him everywhere he goes. And uh, if he does find lead later in the year, we can backtrack where he's been and, and sample and try to uh, 
determine where he got it from. The purpose of this project is um, these trumpeter swans mainly. Um, over the last four years, we've had at least 860 of them have um, succumbed to lead poisoning. Um, they're picking up spent pellets uh, as to be used as grit to grind up their food or mistaken as seeds and just eaten. And uh, the, in the grinding action of their food, the lead breaks down and enters their bloodstream. And um, there's uh, some evidence that uh, a swan can succumb to lead poisoning 21 days uh, after it has picked up one or two pellets. And um, these birds are picking up well in excess of of that and um, we don't have a clear idea of how long they live once they've picked up 20 or 30 lead pellets. So we're we're attempting to uh, capture and radio collar 200 trumpeter swans and follow them over the winter and uh, if any of those find lead then then we can backtrack to the hopefully find the source. Before leaving you, here are some places where you may see some of Washington's wildlife during the next few weeks. been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.